Hi, my name is Amy Stone. I'm an extension educator in the area of agriculture and natural resources with Ohio State University in Lucas County in Northwest Ohio. Today, I'm gonna to be presenting a program on the spotted lanternfly entitled, Can You Spot the Spot? My goal in today's presentation is to increase your knowledge about the spotted lanternfly and hopefully encourage you to be part of the battle against this bug in Northwest Ohio. There are a lot of individuals already engaged in the outreach and education of spotted lanternfly here in Ohio, but we need you. We need extra sets of eyes in the sky and boots on the ground, as I like to put it, to help us identify early infestations of this insect before they're allowed to build up in high populations. The session objectives for today include what is the spotted lanternfly? Where is the spotted lanternfly? Why should you care about the spotted lanternfly? And what can you do to help? Let's begin with what is the spotted lanternfly? Mycorma delicatulia is the scientific name for the spotted lanternfly a non-native plant hopper that arrived in the U.S. So let's take a look at the life cycle summary of the spotted lanternfly. As you can see, this illustration was created by Penn State Extension. It's set up in a circular pattern, similar to a clock. And so let's begin at noon. So the eggs um, are present in fall through the winter into the spring where they begin to hatch. First instar nymphs hatch from those egg masses and begin feeding on a pretty wide host range. They go through four nymph instars or stages until finally they reach adulthood, which you can see illustrated here at the nine o'clock area. Those adults continue to feed uh, mate and lay eggs for the next generation. It is important to note that there's one generation per year. So let's take a look at how that feeding actually occurs. Both the adults and the nymphs, stages one through four, feed on the plants by using a piercing sucking mouth part that you can see here illustrated in the center of the photo. They are stem feeders and their mouth parts pierce directly into the bark and are inserted into the phloem vessels. We see this on small branches and the main trunk of those plants that have been identified as host plants or favorite foods for this insect. It is important to note that the spotted lanternfly does not bite or sting humans. It is a feeder of sap from the trunk, the stems, and sometimes leaves. Here's a snapshot of three photos um, of this insect in the adult stage. The photo to the left, an individual kind of by herself or his self, a grouping or mass of them together. And often they will um, be seen in large numbers together feeding in a relatively small area. And finally, the photo on the bottom right hand um, side of the screen um, is an insect with its wings spread apart. And you can actually see the more vibrant and brilliant color of this insect. Um, it's probably the easiest to find or spot this insect in the adult stage. Um, they're relatively large, um, pretty showy and spectacular in their size, uh, but we have to be aware of all the different stages. And so we're gonna kind of jump into that and kind of break down each 
um, stage of the life cycle. The spotted lanternfly adults are relatively large plant hoppers. They're about one inch long in length and a half inch wide across. So let's dig a little bit deeper about those adult insects. Um, they have an episomatic coloration, um, which advertises some defense chemicals. Um, it potentially can scare away other insects or predators that may be um, kind of finding them um, or attacking. They have this flash display uh, when they're disturbed. Um, so you can see as they kind of raise those top wings, um, you'll see some bright reds um, and blacks and then the body almost appears kind of silvery um, and often it has kind of a yellow tinge to it. The adults are described as poor flyers. Um, some people will say they kind of flutter in flight. Um, they also will gather or congregate in masses or groups when they do some migration. And um, I've had people describe this, you know, looking up into the sky, they just see these huge numbers um, or groups of spotted lanternfly kind of getting caught up in the wind current and moving from place to place. They do have kind of a moth-like appearance, um, but remember they are plant hoppers. Um, if you tend to look at the insect uh, from a side view, they almost will hold their wings kind of tight and it appears tent-like. Um, and that's a characteristic of kind of in general, the plant hoppers and kind of the look that they have. All right, a little bit more on the adults. Um, they appear in late summer. And so right now, if you would be out, scouting um, or monitoring for spotted lanternfly. Uh, this would be the stage of the insect that you would be seeing in September. Um, during this part of their life cycle, they continue to feed um, like they were doing as nymphs. Um, they're mating and then they're also laying eggs for next year's generation. This photo um, I like to include in the presentations. Um, you know, we talked a little bit earlier uh, about the vibrant and brilliant color of spotted lanternfly, that it's actually a real, a pretty insect um, that kind of stands out. But you'll see on the screen right now, there are multiple adults that are on this trunk of the tree. Um, and depending on what that trunk looks like, um, you can see here, they almost kind of camouflage into it. And so, you know, if you took a look at it, um, you would see some movement of the insects, which may draw your eye, uh, but it's really important to take that close look uh, and not just kind of walk by the host plants that we'll talk about in a little bit, um, especially if you're monitoring for adults. So get your head in there, uh, really take a close look, um, because once you see them, they stand out, uh, but from a distance, they can kind of camouflage and, and kind of uh, blend right in with the trunk. This photo just shows you, um, it's kind of a, a lighter colored bark, so they stand out, stand out a little bit more, uh, but two adults that are mating. And then this is a result of that. And so uh, we're gonna jump in to the egg masses in just a bit, uh, but you'll see they're kind of arranged um, or laid in chains. And so there's multiple eggs kind of massed together in these rows or columns. Um, typically there are 30 to 50 eggs that the adult female will lay. Uh, before we go on, um, and really kind of dive into the egg mass stage of this insect. Um, wanted to show you some photos. Again, these are pretty high populations. And so hopefully this is not what we would see here in Ohio, um, but in Pennsylvania, where this insect has been, 
and other states now. Um, as population numbers grow, um, they will feed in swarms um, to the point where you're not going to be able to see stems, branches, or trunks. There's just so many spotted lanternfly um, that are feeding on that. You'll notice they're not feeding um, on the fruit or the leaves. Um, they're really primarily sticking to that main trunk or branches of the tree. Another host uh, that the adults really um, prefer or go after um, are grapevines. Um, and so you can see here, the adults have kind of gathered on those woody stems. Um, it's difficult to, to see a lot of those stems, uh, but they're underneath where those insects are feeding. Um, in addition to their presence, right, we see the adults uh, feeding, gathering together in mass. They are um, exuding um, or pumping out what we call honeydew, uh, which is a sugary substance that collects um, on the plant typically underneath where the feeding is occurring. Um, and so in the case of grapevines, it's usually just um, other leaves, branches, fruit that's underneath where the adults are feeding. Um, in the case of larger trees or let's say um, hops vine, whatever is underneath um, can also accumulate this honeydew. And so that's another thing to kind of be on the lookout for is this really um, sticky kind of a sappy type substance um, that's very sugary in appearance. So let's move on a little bit and talk about uh, the egg stage of this insect. So they um, are laid. We showed a picture um, a little bit earlier, kind of in those columns or rows of individual eggs. Um, they are typically covered then with a waxy coating. Um, I kind of think of it as a blanket over the top, but it's not soft like a, you think of a blanket. Um, this is really kind of a, a hard waxy um, material that then protects them throughout the winter and early spring. Egg masses um, are typically about one to one and a half inches long and about a half to three fourths of an inch wide. Um, those egg masses can be laid absolutely anywhere and I'll illustrate that in just a little bit. Um, it is the overwintering stage of the insect, and so late fall into winter and then early spring is a great time to look for egg masses. Um, they have a different look to them throughout the year as they age, and so um, you know the photo that's on the screen right now illustrates a pretty recently laid egg mass, and so that that waxy kind of covering. Um, is is um, totally covering most of the eggs. Um, you will see, however, there are a few eggs at the top of that egg mass uh, that they totally didn't get covered. If you're familiar with gypsy moth, um, this is kind of giving you a comparison to gypsy moth egg masses, which are gypsy moth egg mass. So a single mass here on the lower right hand side, it's kind of a tan or buff colored, almost looks velvety in appearance. And then two spotted lanternfly egg masses. Um, so, you know, the one is probably about um, equal size to the gypsy moth, although it's kind of got cut off on the, the upper portion of the photo. Uh, but the one to the far left, a little bit smaller, um, so they do vary a bit in their size. But again, um, it's not that soft, kind of velvety type appearance that gypsy moth would have. This is more of a, a smooth, a um, little bit harder in appearance um, as that covering to protect the eggs is present. All right, so let's take a look at some egg masses. It is important to know, and I mentioned it earlier, that eggs can be laid on any flat surface. In fact, um, they believe 
that there were eggs that were laid on some decorative stone that was shipped from China to the United States and that's how the insect was accidentally introduced. Um, this photo shows some egg masses on a main trunk of a tree. Um, you can see there's multiple egg masses um, to the left of kind of that dark kind of wet streak that you see on this particular trunk. There are some egg masses that you'll see to the right of that split um, or crack in this particular trunk or um, it could be a, a smaller branch. Um, and so you kind of have to get your eyes really kind of focused on what to look for because sometimes it can be difficult depending on the color of the branch or stem for these egg masses to really be obvious. In addition to trees and, and other plants, um, they can again be laid on any surface. Uh, people I think are agreeing that um, the female likes to lay eggs on metal, uh, particularly rusty metal, um, like this barrel here. So you can see multiple egg masses at the bottom near the ground. Um, and so looking really at all different kinds of items around um, doesn't necessarily have to be related to trees when you're searching for those egg masses. There is a concern um, that eggs could be laid on rail cars um, and even other vehicles. And so wherever that rail car or vehicle that has egg masses on it, if they're not removed and destroyed, um, in the spring, when it's time for the nymphs to hatch, uh, wherever that vehicle that has the egg masses on it is, could then become a potential new infestation of spotted lanternfly. Now, as the season progresses um, and time um, accumulates, that waxy coating um, will dry and kind of crack or age. And so I think that's important to visually see and remember uh, because as you progress through, let's say, you know, looking for these egg masses in the winter and early spring, they're just not going to look as um, fresh as they did in the fall. Uh, both of these photos are kind of aged uh, with that waxy appearance over the top of the egg mass. Uh, but you'll also notice that not all of the eggs were covered with that waxy appearance. And so you can see a couple chains outside of that um, here in, in these two photos. Here are um, kind of our, is a comparison of two different egg masses, one that was covered with the waxy substance and one that was not. And so you can see the egg mass on the top um, you can actually see the individual eggs kind of laid in those rows or columns or chains as some people describe. And then the second egg mass below it, um, so underneath that, that brown off-white kind of um, waxy coating would be the eggs. And so top totally uncovered, bottom covered up. Pennsylvania um, included a few slides that I wanted to include in this presentation um, to again kind of get you trained in looking for egg masses. And so um, you might be able to spot this egg mass right away um, on this particular branch or trunk of a tree, uh, but they've kind of darkened the slide and really um, kind of highlighted where that egg mass is to again to kind of train our eyes on what to look for. Um, here are some egg masses that were laid on um, a birch tree. Again, sometimes they may stick out really to people and be very noticeable. Uh, but if not, you can see as they lightened up the bark even more, those egg masses really stand out now. 
same thing here on these individual twigs or branches. So multiple egg masses. And you'll see them, again, they darkened up the slide um, to have those egg masses stand out. Here's one uh, where we've got an adult um, next to a few egg masses um, on something metal and rusty. And there those egg masses are kind of standing out. And here you'll see an egg mass um, and two adults that are on the structural supports of what looks to be or appears to be maybe a picnic table. And so looking um, at different angles and kind of underneath, especially as it relates to, to furniture or things that are outside where these adults could choose to lay the eggs. This is a piece of concrete multiple egg masses here. But at first glance, or if you weren't familiar with spotted lanternfly, I mean, it almost may look like, you know, mud accumulation or, you know, something else that is kind of natural. Uh, but you can see as they kind of edit the slide or play with the colors, there are multiple egg masses. So lots of potential nymphs that would hatch um, if those egg masses aren't dealt with by scraping and removing. In Pennsylvania and other states that are dealing with active reproducing populations, uh, they're encouraging the public to go out um, and search for these egg masses, scrape them off, and destroy them. And so you can see here, they're actually using a spotted lanternfly, kind of a, a plastic type card that's used to, to get underneath there, scrape those off. Um, and this individual is actually scraping them into a plastic bag. So those eggs are gonna hatch in the spring. Um, they're gonna go through four instars or stages as as, as nymphs. Um, they can be very small, especially those first, second instars. Um, some people describe them as ticks um, as far as a size comparison, um, but let's take a look. So in the first three instars, uh, this is what we're gonna see. So they're black with white spots, um, first in star are going to be much smaller than second and then finally third. So as they molt and get larger, uh, their bodies are going to grow and so um, they'll just be a little bit larger for each of those in stars or stages. You can see here this one is actually going from the third in star into the fourth or final instar um, in that nymph stage. And something really unique happens at that fourth instar. They actually become, you can see the black lower part of their body, but then they have some red um, with white spots and kind of black patterns or colors. And so this is um, the main difference between first, second, and third which is totally black and white, to a fourth instar that's black, white, and now red. So those are the two color variations that you'll see um, in that nymph stage. Um, again, they can um, gather and you can have a lot of them in one location, which kind of makes it a little bit easier for them to be noticeable. Uh, but in Ohio, since we don't have or haven't detected yet a reproducing population, um, we're anticipating that numbers would be pretty low. And so you really have to kind of seek out and, and look for those. I just want to highlight a little information about impact and kind of the result of both the feeding of the nymphs and the adults. And so what you'll notice is when you have an infested tree or shrub, 
um, when these insects use their piercing, sucking mouth parts and kind of pull out, there's a small area where that injury occurred where the sap may continue to flow or run down the branch or main trunk. And so that's shown um, kind of just one area on the photo to the far left, right? So there was one insect that was feeding. It pulled out the mouth parts and you can see where that bleed or that sap um, is occurring. The, the photo in the center um, illustrates there's lots of feeding that was occurring um, early on and a collection of that sap that's running. And then also um, we will see this black sooty mold. Um, it can attach itself to this bleed, right? And so the, the natural sap that's flowing from the tree after the feeding injury occurred we can also see black sooty mold on that honeydew or that excrement that I talked a little bit about earlier. And so um, I was in Pennsylvania, it's been a couple years now, and was in an area where there was a pretty high infestation. Um, and the trees, it was a little bit later in the season, so the majority of the feeding of the adult was done but there was a pretty high combination of this bleeding and honeydew. And the plants where this injury was occurring almost looked black. And so that was that sooty mold that came in kind of secondary to the, the feeding of the spotted lanternfly. But that can be something else uh, that you may want to kind of tune your eyes to or remember um, as you're scouting. So if you see a lot of black sooty mold, um, it's usually a result of, a, of an insect. Um, but especially if we see this on a lanthus or tree of heaven, which we're going to talk about in just a bit when we talk about the host preference of this insect, um, that really should kind of raise a flag and really get your head in there to, to look for more signs and symptoms um, and potentially the actual insects themselves. The other thing that occurs when we see a lot of this sap bleeding or the honeydew uh, building up um, in the fall wasps and hornets um, can really be attracted to this and in fact in Pennsylvania uh, the first homeowner um, who was concerned about what was happening they were alarmed by the number of yellow jackets and hornets that were um, kind of flying around these trees that had this excess sap and honeydew and so it wasn't hey what is this other insect or what's going on but why all of a sudden am I seeing so many um, yellow jackets and hornets in the fall and so they you know made the phone call there was a site visit and it was obviously alarming to see those insects there um, but what somebody then did see were the spotted lanternfly as well and so that was what kind of was the first um, identification of the insect in Pennsylvania and just another insect there uh, that we tend to see, especially in the fall, attracted to those um, high sugary type substances like the sap and the honeydew. And again, another picture of where there was honeydew present on leaves and then that sooty mold comes in and kind of gives that blackened appearance. Um, just another thing to look for um, in the world of spotted lanternfly. All right, we're going to take a little break from the, the insect itself to one of its favorite food sources, and that is Tree of Heaven or Alanthus. Um, the insect itself, um, especially as a nymph, has a pretty wide host range, um, and it can feed on you know, trees and shrubs perennials, some annuals, um, so it has a, a relatively wide host range. Uh, but as it matures and becomes an adult, um, one of its 
favorite or probably the favorite is the Alanthus or Tree of Heaven. And so in our monitoring, uh, we are suggesting that people find Tree of Heaven or Alanthus in their neighborhood, um, in their community. And that could be the tree or trees that they monitor for adult activity. Here's some photos of um, Alanthus. Um, it is a tree that grows pretty rapidly, but can look kind of shrubby in appearance, um, especially in its the younger growth. Um, it's a very vigorous non-native plant that um, if you cut back trying to manage just through mechanical means, um, it will send up multiple um, sprouts from the, the root system. And so if you have Tree of Heaven on your own property that you want to manage, uh, we do have a really good fact sheet on controlling um, unwanted uh, non-native invasive plant material. And I would refer you to that. Um, the leaves are compound and so they're relatively large and can be up to three feet in length. Um, the other thing with uh, Tree of Heaven, it has almost a, a rancid peanut butter smell to it. And so even if you kind of brush up against it, um, you can get that just horrible odor. Uh, it's especially present if you're kind of questioning that or maybe you don't have the best sense of smell to kind of crush the leaves. Um, it's just it's kind of a stinky plant. Um, and once you can um, smell that, um, it's a really good characteristic uh, because there are some things that you might um, at first glance get it confused with. The other thing to help identify um, Alanthus or Tree of Heaven, um, Tom DeHaas and Andrew Holden have created a YouTube video um, and we can get you and share that link with you um, that you could view and it kind of shares or compares and contrasts Alanthus to sumac um, and wal uh, walnut that are two plants that sometimes can get confusing. There are uh, female and male Alanthus or Tree of Heaven. Uh, the female uh, right now have seeds that are developing and at first they start out to be kind of this yellowish light green color that really kind of blend in with the foliage so it's difficult for them to for you to see them here. Up close a little bit you can kind of see the difference as there it's more yellow rather than green and those are the seeds. As they mature uh, they kind of tend to turn kind of a pink to a mauve to kind of a burgundy rusty brown color um, and right now they are really obvious and really standing out um, and that's important um, when we talk about managing uh, for the tree of heaven um, if you have multiple trees and you can identify which ones are female those are the ones that we like to go after first um, because there can be hundreds and thousands of seeds produced from those trees. And so we can hopefully reduce or eliminate um, at least the seed reproduction uh, by going after those plants. Um, there is thought to be able to leave like one kind of lone male uh, to be able to monitor for spotted lanternfly. Here's just a few characteristics um, about that host plant. So the bark is relatively smooth, um, kind of light in color. Um, and that's the photo on the upper left. Uh, lower left is the flower um, earlier in the season. You'll notice in the center, the stems are pretty stout um, and the buds kind of sit right in the bud scar. Um, so it's almost like heart-shaped kind of in appearance. The photos to the right um, are the leaflets, so individual leaflets um, together make one large leaf. But you'll notice at the base where the, the bottom lobe is, there are these small kind of glands or, or bumps. And sometimes it's difficult to actually see them. 
but you can feel them. And so um, if you're questioning, gosh, is it sumac? Is, is it walnut? I, I, I'm not sure. I'm still learning. Um, at the base of each of those leaflets, kind of feel for that, that bumper gland. Um, and you can see that that's illustrated here, especially in the the lower right photo. Um, that one's really obvious, kind of that dark green in color and circular in, in pattern. So now we're going to kind of kind of step forward and dive in a little bit deeper um, on host plants, because I think this is a really important to know. Again, like I had mentioned, the preferred host is Tree of Heaven or Alanthus. But you'll also notice there's apples, there's hops, and of course, grapes. Um, and so if you enjoy wine, um, you know, this pest is of particular interest um, and might kind of be up on your list to, to be on the alert for. Um, there are vineyards in Pennsylvania that have had high mortality. Um, the insect feeding uh, will stress the plant. Um, that coupled with maybe um, growing conditions, um, so cold temperatures during the winter, droughts during the summer, um, can be enough to stress uh, those vines um, and see some mortality. So in summary, uh, let's kind of, again, revisit that life cycle. So egg masses, we're going to start to see those a little bit later in the fall, um, and they will be in that stage all the way through spring uh, when we'll see some uh, nymph activity hatch from those masses. Those egg masses can be found on trunks and stems and any flat surface. Um, there is a preference for things that are, are metal and, and maybe even rusty metal uh, for her to lay those eggs, uh, but they can also be laid on, on vehicles. Uh, we've seen that on firewood, uh, nursery stock. And so we just have to be, I mean, think of any surface, any flat surface that's outdoors at the time where this insect is mating and laying eggs could be a potential uh, location uh, for those eggs to be laid on. The nymphs will hatch out of those egg masses uh, beginning in the spring through late summer. Um, usually into September, so that time frame right now, uh, the nymphs will probably likely be done and we'll be seeing all adults. Uh, the first, first, second, and third instar of the nymphs are, remember, black with white spots. And fourth instar, they change a little bit um, and have those patches of, of red, uh, which really kind of can tell you, um, not just based on size, but that color pattern that is fourth and the final nymph stage of that insect. And then finally, the adults. Again, if you're out looking for spotted lanternfly, uh, this is the stage of the insect that you would be seeing now in September. Um, we tend to recommend that you really focus on Alanthus or Tree of Heaven. But of course, if you have an orchard, um, hops, or grapes, um, you could definitely be looking um, on those plants um, too, in addition to any tree of heaven that you have um, in the area. You'll also be looking for some um, heavy sap flow from the stem feeding um, injury that occurred by both the nymphs and the adults. Um, and remember that um, sappy sugary substance, either from the sap, from the injury, or from the honeydew, um, could attract this black sooty mold. Um, and we would see that accumulate on leaves, on stems, anything below where that feeding occurred, uh, where that injury occurred, and even on the forest floor um, could have kind of a black appearance with that sooty mold. Finally, you might also be seeing um, some of the 
yellow jackets, uh, bald-faced hornets, um, any insects that are drawn to that sugary substance, um, especially into the fall. And then of course, um, you could also find um, the actual insects themselves. So just um, again, kind of going over the uh, life cycle, one generation per year. Um, so starting out as the eggs, again, 30 to 50 approximate eggs per mass, um, first, second, third, and then finally fourth instar of the nymphs, and that fourth instar being a little bit different because of the patches of red on its body. And then finally, um, you will see some adult activity. And so adults can be present until we have really a, a hard freeze. And so depending on the weather conditions and what mother nature is dealing with, uh, dealing us, um, I mean, there could be um, some insect activity of the adult stage, you know, into November and maybe even December, uh, depending on those temperatures. So that's a really a look at kind of the life cycle, the biology, and then also some host plant information. So we've covered what is the spotted lanternfly. Now let's jump into where is the spotted lanternfly. So let's learn a little bit more about this insect's history or past. The insect is native to China, India, and Indochina. Um, it was not native to Japan and Korea, which are currently also battling some infestations. In North America, the first vine was discovered in Pennsylvania in September of 2014, when an active infestation was found in southeastern Pennsylvania. It has now been expanded to 26 Pennsylvania counties. Since that time, there's also been active infestations, which includes all life stages um, that were found in six other states, including Delaware, Maryland, New Jersey, New York, Virginia, and West Virginia. This number may continue to grow and expand as new finds are discovered or detected um, in those surrounding or neighboring states. Additionally, there are various states such as Massachusetts, North Carolina, Connecticut, and Ohio that have found various life stages of the insect. Usually they have been adults, uh, but they're not reproducing populations. And so that may be a little bit confusing as there's been a lot of social media um, coverage and sharing that, hey, spotted lanternfly has been detected in Ohio. And there have been um, individual finds of what we're calling hitchhikers, um, but those, it's not a, a reproducing population. So there isn't a, a likely infestation, although those points um, where the individuals have been found are definitely points of interest and there's a lot of monitoring that's going around on in that area or region. Uh, but for a state to declare that they have a spotted lanternfly infestation, there has to be a reproducing population. So multiple stages of the insect found at once, for example, egg masses and nymphs, or nymphs and adults, um, populations that would be breeding, that would be increasing an infestation or population, um, and not just an individual hitchhiker um, that was you know, caught in the grill of a, a vehicle um, or other modes of transportation. Um, for example, the, um, the situation, one of the situations in Ohio, it was an individual uh, went to visit somebody in, uh, outside of the Philadelphia area. 
Um, they noticed that there was a lot of adult activity when they were there. Uh, they returned home to Ohio. The next morning they noticed um, one adult um, that they quickly um, took care of and smashed and, and, and killed. Uh, but it did go through the process or protocol that it was identified um, as a positive spotted lanternfly. Um, they are doing some monitoring just to make sure that it was just the one and not others that then could be the beginning of a reproducing population. And so I think that's really important and we'll illustrate that in a map that I'm going to show in just a bit um, about what an active infestation is versus a, a find of spotted lantern fly. This is the map of Pennsylvania and so um, the area in tan were the existing quarantines prior to the expansion in 2020 and so Berks County is right there in the center and that was where the initial find was. Um, you can see Philadelphia to the far kind of bottom right um, if that gives you a perspective of, of where in the state um, this is. The additional counties that were added to the quarantine are in the lighter blue and the infestation within that county was um, illustrated with a darker color. So it currently may not be the entire county that's infested. It might be a relatively small part um, or area within the county. Um, and they have shown this in, in their latest kind of quarantine map. What's of particular interest, especially to Ohioans, is the two counties to the far left in blue, uh, Beaver and Allegheny. And so Beaver County um, butts up right against the Ohio border. And so those were relatively new finds in 2020, um, both tied um, to transportation hubs, um, kind of uh, along railways which is obviously a, a concern, um, but really kind of put spotted lanternfly on the map in Ohio and a lot of outreach activity and involvement has been occurring because of those finds so close to the state line. This is a larger map of kind of the larger um, area dealing with spotted lanternfly. Um, you know, it was the map was created in March of 2020, so there's been a few additional finds uh, within these designated states. Um, Ohio has not yet been added officially to the map with its um, find of individual, an individual find uh, rather than that reproducing population. And that's indicated here. So there are purple individual dots in the county where those individual finds were. So again, not a reproducing population, uh, likely a hitchhiker, um, and a lot of survey work is being done in those areas to make sure there is an unestablished population. You can see the, the, the blue area in Pennsylvania and then into New Jersey, Delaware, Maryland, and then Virginia and West Virginia, where they're also dealing with some fines. Um, and so this kind of just gives you a big picture of where the insect is. Um, and again, we'll need to be updated um, to include the Ohio find on the, the eastern border. Know that um, there is a proposed action area in 2020. Um, this area um, is in northeast Ohio, closest to the find in Beaver and Allegheny counties in Pennsylvania. And this is where the Ohio Department of Agriculture is really focusing their efforts as it relates to traps, as it relates to monitoring, although any suspect find anywhere across the state of Ohio becomes a priority and they will follow up on that. Additionally, USDA is um, doing some monitoring um, across the state 
in areas that are highly visible as it relates to transportation hubs um, and, and regions. And so uh, both USDA and ODA are looking at railways as a potential point of introduction. And so this map just kind of illustrates some railways where they're coming out of Pennsylvania or going back into Pennsylvania. And so um, looking at areas where trains may sit for a period of time, uh, because this obviously would be a concern um, if egg masses were on those train cars or rail cars um, parked in an area in the spring when the hatch um, were to occur. Additionally, um, both ODA and USDA is looking at interstates and highway systems. Um, people coming out of Pennsylvania, either visiting you know, family or friends um, at a public level or potentially um, you know, truck and trailer traffic um, hauling product from an infested area into an uninfested area and then raising awareness with those individuals. Um, so if you've been to an area that you know had spotted lanternfly, making sure that you're inspecting your vehicles before leaving so you're not um, bringing an infestation to somewhere um, that you're, is at your end destination. So our next session objective is why should I care about the spotted lanternfly? Why, you know, what's, what's the big deal? So from one to 1,000, um, as a homeowner, they could become a nuisance strictly by their numbers. Um, and we're seeing this um, and hearing reports of what homeowners in Pennsylvania and other states now um, are seeing in their own landscapes or when they go to a park for a visit. Um, and so this is why we want to find a small isolated infestation if it's here very early on so we don't see those numbers build up um, extremely fast like they have in Pennsylvania. And so you can see here the photo on the right um, is a large tree that is infested. Um, there are some kids toys, there's a swing um, where you'll see some insect activity, um, that sooty mold will start to accumulate on things near trees. Um, you know, just they're just a nuisance with their numbers. And so, you know, if people don't like insects, um, they may not be able to be out, um, you know, on patios or just sitting outside enjoying the outdoors when there's hundreds and maybe thousands of spotted lanternfly. Um, they also can cause um, some injury uh, that may weaken a plant. Um, they're not outright killers by any means, uh, but that their actual infestation or feeding coupled with something else may, you know, open them up to other insect activity um, or in combination with a really cold winter or maybe a drought could cause some injury. Um, in the case of we had mentioned, um, you know, vineyards, apple orchards, um, hops, um, the potential of, you know, the public being there. Um, again, lots of insects um, becoming a nuisance, um, that excrement accumulating um, in honeydew, and then ultimately sooty mold accumulating on fruit um, can cause some decline um, in the fruit itself, um, or even people's willingness to, to purchase or to, to eat. A couple things here, um, just really, you know, looking for egg masses. Um, you can see the spotted lantern fly on the back of somebody's collar, again, a nuisance issue. Um, the bottom left, we've got a hitchhiker, um, just so people are aware, looking at vehicles if they're going into an infested area. 
Um, and then this photo on the bottom right hand side, um, the number of spotted lanternfly nymphs on this tire. Now most of those would probably or likely be killed as the vehicle moves and they get crushed. Um, but there probably would be some survivors. And so uh, really looking at vehicles um, as you're traveling in and out of infested areas is, is very important. That's so important that Pennsylvania actually has created a checklist for, re for residents um, living in um, spotted lantern flag quarantine areas. Um, I include this one to give Pennsylvania a shout out that they're trying to do all the right things to limit the spread of this insect. Um, a huge amount of outreach and education to get people aware of what's going on, making sure they're not moving it within the state of Pennsylvania, uh, but to other states. Uh, they're also working with commercial um, travel, um, truck drivers um, to do the same. And so this kind of just really is a checklist before, um, in this case, you move or leave the quarantine, what things you're looking for. And then also some great photos. Um, and this is kind of a, a self check for homeowners to do uh, before leaving the quarantine. Um, and additionally, for commercial folks, um, there is a permit system that people have to take some training um, to make sure that they're uh, following the, the rules and the regulations of that quarantine. Finally, as we're winding down, what can you do or what can I do to help with spotted lantern fly? Probably the number one thing is really to be on the lookout and report anything that you see that's suspect. One way that you can do this is you can download the Great Lakes Early Detection Network app. Um, and when you're out in your landscape or going for a walk in a park, um, you can report one, Alanthus, two, spotted lanternfly and in fact um, if you really want to help um, you can identify that that Alanthus or tree of heaven and then visit that on a weekly basis let us know you're doing that um, and this app allows for negative reports so you could tell us each time you're out looking for spotted lanternfly even if you don't see it you can say nope negative report so at least we know that hey somebody's in that area watching in addition, there's all sorts of other invasive species that you can report using that app. Um, just a quick tutorial. Um, you can search by category. There's, you know, aquatics, there's grasses, trees and shrubs, insects, wildlife. Um, this app has it all um, as it relates to invasive species. Here's a continued list of what you look for. Um, in the case of Alanthus or Tree of Heaven, uh, you would hit the trees category. You can see here, um, you can scroll through, uh, find that there's additional photos if you're not sure if that's what you're seeing or not. Some more photos that I showed earlier of the plant uh, with the seeds and then up close those stouty, real thick stems. And here is just a description of that particular plant. Um, the Great Lakes Early Detection Network app uses the EDD map system, which is the early detection and distribution mapping system. And so you're gonna have your own username and passcode here that you're gonna have to log into uh, when using the app. Uh, this one is actually a screenshot that somebody did when they were reporting ornam Oriental Bittersweet. Uh, we ask that you take a photo of what you're seeing. Um, it takes the long and lap from your phone. Um, you can include the time spent and then the size of the infestation and hit save. Those reports go into the queue. Um, and then once you get someplace um, that has more reliable internet, um, so you're not using your data out in the field, you can hit Q, send Q, and then the, all those reports go um, to where they're supposed to.
We actually have an hour long presentation on the Woodland Stewards website on how to use the app if you're really interested and want to learn more and join us uh, by doing that. And then once they get verified, um, that becomes a red dot. If there is a suspect spotted lanternfly uh, report, those will go through ODA for confirmation. There's a great pest alert if you want to learn more or have those with you to pass out to friends, families, and neighbors to continue to raise awareness. And also some banners and identification cards that are important. Just let us know and we can get those to you. There is a website that's kind of a landing page for all things Spotted Lanternfly. Go.osu.edu backslash SLF or spotted lantern fly or spot the spot. You can use any of those. They have fact sheets, recorded PowerPoint presentations, videos, frequently asked questions, some upcoming events, uh, blog type updates, um, links to maps and other resources. And so it's a great go-to site uh, to get to the information that you need. Finally, there's some information um, updates on the Buckeye Yard and Garden line that you can subscribe to, uh, receive those alerts about spotted lanternfly, but of course about a lot of other horticultural topics. Highly recommend the Buckeye Yard and Garden line. And finally, one of my favorite, um, Invasive.org. So if uh, you, I've tempted you about invasive species and you want to learn more, this is a great website to check out. I hope that you enjoyed this presentation on the spotted lanternfly and learned a little bit along the way. If you have any questions, don't hesitate to reach out to me at stone.91 at osu.edu or your local extension office can also help get the information and answer those questions that you need. Thank you and have a great day.